All right, moving on to the Division Three playoff world where we had a pseudo-playoff uh, play-in round, so to speak, and we've got actually more teams playing in week two of the playoffs than week one. But still, Jimmy, a lot of great games in that week one slate. A couple of them did get out of hand, but uh, we had some really competitive ones that came down to the wire. Yeah, we did. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about it. Well, let's start things off then. We had Alfred State going on the road at Endicott, and this one, I think... A lot of people kind of expected to be a dominant performance. Then you look at the final score and just the box score in itself, you see 44 to nothing, and you're like, holy shit, the goals took care of business. But, you know, when I sat down and watched this game, it was a really slow start for this, you know, this Endicott offense. There were some incomplete passes, a narrowly missed interception in the first quarter from that Alfred State defense. And, uh, you know, they got them, that defense got them into a couple third and longs. They were pretty uncomfortable to start things off. And I just don't think the 44 nothing is very indicative of how this game started in the first half. No, yeah, for the majority of the first half, like you said, it was 3 0. Like, there, uh, Alfred State was hanging around. A lot of people were not anticipating that. Um, like you said, just a couple, like that costly going for, going forward on fourth down and one on your own 20. It kind of, you know, it was pretty tough uh, to not get that. Obviously, it's a pretty big gamble to take. Um, you know, they ran the ball really effectively uh, late as well. Endicott did. And that was pretty three rushing touchdowns in the fourth quarter. You know, you just got to go to your bread and butter and, um, and you're up late. And they sure, they sure did that. Yeah, sure. yeah, they definitely seem to have control as the game went on to that line of scrimmage. And you see, you know, watching the tape here, the defense stepped up in a big way, generate a couple turnovers, and you start making some plays behind the line of scrimmage. That's all recipe for success. But you said it, that fourth and one on their own 20, they don't convert for the Pioneers. And uh, the goals only got a field goal out of it. So for me, I was like, that's actually a win. You know, you give up the ball on your own 20-yard line, which was a hell of a gamble, by the way. Um, but they only get a yeah. field goal out of that, and I felt like the Pioneers are still in this one over there at Alfred State. And as the game went on, it really just started to uh, to slip away from them. And to highlight some of those individual performances that you had kind of mentioned there, I mean, <clears throat> in the air, nothing ridiculous, um, 160 yards for this Endicott offense. But on the ground, they had a couple guys that certainly stood out. And, you know, you finished with 343 yards net rushing on the ground, and that is yeah. – very, very good telling sign of a dominant performance when it comes to the ground game and the line of scrimmage. And I talked about that defensive effort. Uh, Twardorski had that interception, the one of them, and then Mason Backery with the other for that Endicott defense. Not a whole lot of sacks in the day, but that really was more because not a whole lot of dropbacks for this Alfred State team. And uh, in the TFL department, though, you had five different guys registering some hits behind the line of scrimmage. So Endicott smoothly cruises through round one, but uh, how about that round two matchup? Yeah, that'll be a fun one. No, I was, I was talking about that one last – we were off the air. We were talking about it last week. We didn't want to just assume Endicott was going to win, but, no, that'll be, that'll be a super fun one to watch next week. That is going to be uh, that is going to be a really exciting one. But we can move forward. This one I know I was excited about and had some pretty high expectations coming in, that being Coe College heading over to Bethel. And this was the one where uh, we thought Coe was actually hosting this game. There was kind of an error on the selection show from the NCAA and, the, yeah, and kind of that cool one. site. <laughs> That was a little bit of a misstep there, but uh, that ends up the game being at Bethel. The Royals take this one in a very, very close contest. 31-26, probably the more back and forth of the uh, early slate of games. What did you see in this one from the Royals? Uh, well, I saw that uh, Co did everything in their power to take away Joey Kidder, especially in the red zone. I don't know if you saw this picture, Kobe, but they they had like you know like the picture of Megatron and against like the, uh, the Saints and the Seahawks, whatever. They had two yes. guys on them. Like I'm, a, they were doing that to Kidder. In that game, I don't know if you saw that. Uh, somewhat, I think Mikey Schultz tweeted that. Shout out to Mikey. But uh, yeah, Kidder still had a heck of, had a heck of a game. Thirteen receptions, one hundred nine. Uh, uh, Micah New Newald, sorry, <laughs> Newald. That's a tough one to pronounce. Fifteen for one hundred nine as well. Uh, Bethel was really efficient through the air, but they did turn over the ball three times. They fumbled three times, but Co also fumbled three times. So a lot of turnovers in this one. A little bit sloppy on both sides, but uh, Bethel still managed to come out with the victory. Yeah, and I think a big turning point for me in this one, I mean, you go into halftime, Bethel is up 21-20. It's still at, at literally anyone's game at this point. And watching this game, they're very close to scoring at the end of the half, all the way down in Coe's side of the field. They come out, they don't get their last time out off, and the clock runs down, and they go into halftime. Again, still winning by one point, but that felt like at that point in the game, and this ends up being a five-point, one-possession ball game, 
that was a costly mistake from that Bethel squad. I believe they still had timeouts on the board and just were not able to get that one off. And I'll have to double check and make sure I'm correct on that one. But watching that game, it felt like that was a really big momentum swing opportunity for this Cohawk squad because I think a lot of coaches will talk about you have to go and have that momentum going into the half and out of the half. Those are kind of swing plays and swing moments, those two, three minutes going into that halftime and then coming out of who's going to determine the pace of play moving forward. But we'll keep things going. This one... This got out of hand. Mount St. Joseph yeah. goes on the road to John Carroll, and I had this one on. I've got a lot of notes on this one, Jimmy, because admittedly I was quite dumbfounded watching certain portions um, of this game, and I think it starts here with the offense for John Carroll. They established themselves first, running the football between the tackles. They finished with a field goal, still kind of feeling out that defense, but very much so establishing the line of scrimmage and felt like they were really getting comfortable building confidence, you know, the blue streaks and the run game starts to dominate in the next drive. This time they finish with a touchdown. So first you get a field goal, then you get a touchdown and it felt like it was the snowball effect for John Carroll. And um, this started to get, really out of hand. It felt like, you know, the first half the JCU offense just didn't leave the field. Uh, Mason Russ back-to-back sacks on third down for that Blue Streaks defense. And then there was the uh, what-the-hell 39-yard sack that we can't – I should preface, like, we can't show any of the video because, like, ESPN Plus, and I wouldn't get monetized if I, if yeah. I used it. But I will find – I put out that tweet of from the live stats. A 39-yard sack is one of the most ridiculous things that I've seen in a while. <laughs> And yeah. admittedly, it wasn't really a sack. The quarterback found the turf monster 39 yards back in the backfield. Here's the here's the look from the live stat sheet. Um, no oh, shot wow. at Tyler. I mean, he was he was doing his best out there, but he did find the turf monster and ended up eating it. Loss of 39 yards was a, just kind of a really great way of putting a bow on this one. But yeah, enough. I mean, enough from me. I'll add this: the icing on the cake here, John Carroll. They recover the ensuing kickoff. So they go on and score after this possession. They kick it off. It was like kind of a normal-ish kick, kind of a skied kick, and they got down there and recovered it before MSJ did. No, yeah, that's that's what you cannot have. It kind of uh, looked like the Bears punt return today. I don't know if you saw that. but uh, What's that? The but Minnesota punted one to the Bears today. It went off the guy's foot there. And like, yes. Poison, poison, poison. Yeah, was, Just, those, are always, those are brutal, man. Those are tough. Yeah, I mean, this one got out of hand. You went into halftime, it was 31 to nothing, blue streaks, and and they kind of added on to that. They called the dogs off a little bit in the second half. Yeah. Um, but, again, when you're up 31, that's probably what you should do. You know? Yeah. So It's tough in a playoff know. game, though. You, know, you want to keep your foot on the gas, but at some point, you know, and, th- and that's what it seems they, that they did. But and at some point, it's like, get the guys out of there. I mean, you don't want to have some mm-hmm. of those guys out there that could risk, you know, twisting a knee, twisting an ankle, some of those kind of soft tissue things, too. Like, mm-hmm. those are susceptible to happen whenever. Yeah, and you don't want to lose those guys before, you know, you play uh, the Purple Raiders next week, too. I was going to say, because that gears us up now for a big-time OAC matchup, excuse me, and that's going to be, I mean, we talk about earlier on the slate, Endicott and Cortland and some of these other, Platteville, Wartburg, uh, Johns Mm -hmm. Hopkins, Grove that you go down the list, like, this is it now, man, we're here. Yeah, it's going to be a fun round of Division Three football. Like, it's going to be maybe the most competitive round of them all. Yeah, and this next game, thankfully, was a lot more competitive. That being Maryville traveling to Barry. They take this one 2016, and, um, you know, when I was watching this one, Barry, they drive down the field on the second possession. They punch it in from the one-yard line, and I had heard that Barry had been struggling with some of their kicking game, and I admittedly didn't go back and exactly check the statistics on that. I was really wondering why they went for two um, on the opening yeah. score, and it was, again, I guess no shots at them. It was a dumb two-point try. It was kind of like a pseudo swinging gate type deal where they kicked out a bunch of their offensive linemen and then did a direct snap, and it just got stuffed. And, you know, from there, Maryville responds, two big explosive pass plays. They drive right down the field, score a good PAT, and now you find yourself down 7-6. In a game like this where it finishes 2016, I mean, that's th- those are critical points. And so I don't, I don't know, I guess, the extent of the kicking struggles for Barry, but that felt like a, an interesting decision. Yeah, I don't know what the analytics would say about that one, but like you said, like maybe it's something within the team. Maybe they just want to go for two. Yeah. The kicker was an issue. But, um, you know, Barry is very stagnant on offense. They were held to 210 yards offensively. And Maryville's got a pretty solid defense. So, I mean, that's to be – maybe not to be expected, but, I mean, 210 yards is not enough. You're not going to score a lot of points with only 210 yards. 
Uh, no, you're definitely not. And Brandon no, Cade, who's no. been kind of the face of this Barry squad, 27 carries, 58 yards for him out of that backfield. And you're able to eliminate him, at least really minimize his impact in a game like this. That's a really great uh, recipe for success. The other big metric, obviously, Christian Lewis under center for Barry had three interceptions on the day. And so turning the ball over combined with the fact that you do not have a really predominantly great running game in this game, not that they say they haven't been able to run in the past, what that does is it totally tips the time of possession away from you. And you're keeping your defense out in the field way longer than maybe they should be. So for Maryville, those are all really big pieces um, to their success. You had Jaden Smith, Devin White, and Grant Henderson all had interceptions on the day for that Maryville defense. And that was that was really big time uh, kind of deal. And to go back to the two-point conversion thing, it is interesting because if you remember, when I went down to Elma and, and talking with Scotty down there and one of their, on their coaching staff, he had said that, hey, if we score first, we're going for two every time. And the opponents know it, but we yeah. have found that scoring first and adding on to that and seeing an 8 nothing on the scoreboard is such a big momentum swing for us. So I'd be very curious to hear maybe Barry has a very similar philosophy in that department. Yeah, it sounds very Dan Campbell-y. I don't know. <laughs> it does, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like something Dan Campbell would do. It does, and they took care of business today. I mean, 10-1 and one for the first time, whatever. Yeah, the Lions are really good. <laughs> I'm not, I am not looking forward to Thursday. It's going to be ugly. <laughs> it's going to be ugly, dude. She was going to be eating today. turkey with tears coming down his face. Yeah. As if I would The Division three college football. Oh. No matter who they play, man. Yeah, that is today was today was a, a tough finish, dude. Um, but we'll swing over and talk more D3 ball. You had your sinus at King's College. This one came down to it. 32-29. Kings, the Monarchs, take this one. And we had talked about Kings a little bit earlier on in the year and the fact that they were finally get over the proverbial hurdle that is Delaware Valley. And so for them to do that inside of the MAC and now find their way into the playoffs, and not only that, pick up a win in the first round. Talk to me about this Monarch squad. Yeah, man, they ran the ball really, really well. Uh, Russell Miner Shaw had himself a day, 173 yards on the ground and a touchdown. Uh, when, when you run the ball that effectively, you're going to find yourself winning a lot of football games, as we've said on this show numerous times, especially in the playoffs when the weather gets colder. So running that ball, man, maybe obviously we saw, we saw that on full display this week. Yeah, and you saw there, and I roll on the tape, and you see him air it out now down the field. But there was a safety early on, too. And uh, your shine starts things off 3 nothing with a field goal. Then they tack on a safety and um, a touchdown to boot with that. Now, all of a sudden, it's 12 nothing in the second quarter. And this King squad had to be looking around like, what is going on right now? Absolutely just a different way to get up on a team. And I think their ability to rebound was very impressive because I don't think they've found themselves in many holes like that throughout the course of the season. So for a relatively untested team, I think that was a really impressive rebound for them. And uh, what a momentum swing that is to get a safety when you're trying to bounce back and get your first points on the board and to be able to come back and do that. From there on, though, I mean, the second half was was full of a lot of scoring. I mean, 36 points in the second half alone from both these squads, and it came down right to the end. Your sinus has a 20-yard touchdown pass from Jalen Bradford to uh, Cameron Dennis with about six minutes left. That gave him the lead 29-25, and then Kings College comes down. It was all the way 25 seconds left in the game. Game. Mike DiGregorio, he had the nine-yard touchdown pass from Minor Shaw you talked about earlier. And with less than 30 seconds to go, they get out on top. They kick the extra po extra point to make it a three-point game, 32-29. And, um, you know, they needed a field goal to tie it. They were unable to get it. Defense comes up and, and gets the job done. So big-time win for that uh, that Monarch squad. Huge, huge. I mean, obviously, all playoff wins are huge, but. That I mean, one yeah. being in that, in, that, in that fashion, too, man, oh, man, it's awesome. Shout out to, thank you to ABC16 for that footage as well. I want to make sure I, I reference where I'm getting all this footage from. Um, yep. And to keep things going forward, we're going to head down to Texas in a matchup that I think opened the eyes of a lot of people. Mary Harden Baylor caught a lot of flack heading into the playoffs this year. Only, what, three wins against Division three opponents, and people were coming. They're under fire because, obviously, you missed the playoffs last year for the first time, and who knows how long. I'm not checking the stats right now. I'll tell you, it's been a long time. And this year, to be on the brink and still find their way into the dance, even though playing maybe not the toughest Division three schedule, I think people were doubting, and they kind of silenced a lot of those people this weekend. Uh, video courtesy of KWKT Fox 44. Mary Harden Baylor goes into Trinity and picks up the win, Jimmy, 29-22. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, I, as we talked about, I mean, that catch on that second touchdown, oh, that, 
back in the end zone. That was so sweet, dude. That was beautiful, and I think we'll get yeah. to it here in a second. This might actually be it right here. Yeah. And bam. That's beautiful. Over the shoulder. Absolute dot from Q, by the way. Not going to take him out of the equation, but that was poetry. Yeah, that was that was wicked. And obviously, now next week they got Hart and Simmons, that big, that big uh, rematch, as we talked about. They lost to him twice already. It's really hard to beat a team three times. Yes. It's really hard to beat a team three times. In the same season. I know. It's I mean, when do you stuff. see this happen? You don't, is the answer. You, you really don't in see college, this happen. especially. I mean, you, you, NFL, you know, you got two division games, you play them in the playoffs, like maybe that works out, but like, I mean, it's already, they have a pretty small conference to begin with. You play everybody twice. Yeah, the AFC right fun. now is just in a very weird, bad spot. Mm hmm. Yeah, yes, it definitely it definitely is. And, um, you know, talk about UMHB, too. They dominated the special teams battle. They blocked a punt. That sets up a touchdown for the crew. Then they stopped a fake field goal attempt from the Tigers that saved a touchdown. So those felt like, to me, two really big swing kind of momentum plays. You talk about uh, when games can be boiled down to some of those big swing plays, those sudden change type moments. UMHB won the day with those alone, I thought. And those are kind of two examples of that now trinity at the end of the half they end with a touchdown it felt necessary to keep them in it but they scored again on a great ball thrown on the run and that for me was kind of a oh like shit this might actually be a game because at the time mary harden baylor is up 14 nothing in the second quarter talk about some of those swing plays and then going into half it's 14 12 that was a really big swing in a matter of i'm not kidding two minutes they scored with a minute 54 left to get the ball back and they scored with 48 seconds left in the second half, or second quarter, excuse me. So now you go into halftime, 14-12, and it was literally anyone's game. Came down to it, though. Uh, Asa Osborne had a one-yard touchdown run, and um, Mary Harden Baylor takes this thing in the final two minutes over in-state Trinity Tigers. Woo! Ooh, that, was a, that was a good one. That was a good one. That was, and... Um, not to be a letdown here. This one, not so much. 59-14, no. UW Lacrosse playing host to Northwestern. The Eagles, Coach Janice and company down there, they got the job done. Talk to me about it. Yeah, uh, Kyle Haas continued to deliver for the for the Eagles. 257 yep. through the air, four touchdowns. Jack Janke added two more uh, receiving touchdowns. And uh, Lacrosse is a really dynamic offense. That's what I'm trying to say this week. Um, but Buster, obviously, going to the playoffs, you got to tip the cap to them for making it. Um, they Tough team. I mean, they just ran into a bus. Uh, lacrosse is a really, really good football program. That's just kind of what happens sometimes. But um, good season for Northwestern, though. Eight sacks on the day for that lacrosse defensive unit, dude. Yeah, yeah they get after the quarterback. Eight That's sacks. Eight sacks. 50 rushing yards they allowed. You know, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot to be really happy here oh. if you're lacrosse, who punted only once in the entire contest. Um, there's a lot to be really happy here about. Uh, but – it's, you know, it's next week, right? And they got a big time matchup coming up. They actually lost time possession battle too, which I think was was kind of a weird, a weird metric. Thirty two yeah, minutes to twenty eight. So, when you score so fast, I mean, you're gonna lose time. Yeah, possession. just off the field. <laughs> yeah. Get on, get off, and you know there were some other things that certainly went their way, but now it's like, how do you flush that if you're lacrosse and really gear up for this matchup, St. John's, right, this coming week? No, yeah, it'll be a huge game. Um, that'll be really prepared. Uh, I see Studer didn't really play a lot. I don't know if he's injured or not but maybe they're arresting him for next week but um no obviously it's gonna be a huge one in that environment especially you know what i was thinking though there might not be as much of a home field advantage because a lot of the students will be home for thanksgiving but that's kind of an interesting like point they would still pack that stadium i would assume but like it's a tough weekend to have uh the students all on break because like that home field advantage is so huge for them I think a lot of people run into that problem. It's something that you see very often that these playoff games, especially second round of the playoffs, right? And you're like, yeah. why are there why is there nobody at these games? But you're right. All the students are on break. And so if you're a place that really relies on that student body to show up, which admittedly most of these places are, uh, it could be a little bit less of an advantage. But, you know, I guess we'll see. Let's go out west. Pomona Pitzer taking on Whitworth over there, the Pirates. They take this one 21-13, video courtesy of KREM2 News. And Whitworth... Talking with uh, with Ryan Blair in, in this episode, the quarterback for them, Jimmy, and I think the most impressive thing for this Whitworth team is to win even when things aren't necessarily going all in their favor. They were outgained in this one by a pretty large margin. They've done it a couple times over the course of the year offensively, the running game not going incredibly well for the Pirates. They're able to get some big plays through the air, but when you look at defensively, they step up and they make timely plays like the interception on the six-yard line to close things off. I think that's a really telling sign of a team that could potentially make a run. Now, of course, 
I say that very well knowing that North Central's on the other side of this week. But uh, when you're out gained in that kind of fashion and still find a way to gut out and win playoff football games in November, that's a really good sign. Yeah, and uh, Ryan Blair was the leader of that charge going 303 through the air, three touchdowns. Did get sacked three times, but like you said, like this team's really good with adversity. They bounce back. They don't let it. They don't let it get to them. Uh, receiving wise, uh, Evan Liggett had himself a day, 130 yards and a touchdown for him, along with seven catches. So, you know, they leaned on that pass game and it worked out quite well for him. It definitely has, and that that was uh, Omari Williams on the. Uh, on the game-saving interception, the game-clinching, I guess, so to speak, that was uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, play on the day. And uh, Pitzer, two interceptions through the air. That certainly is going to bite you in the ass at some point, man. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, um, you know, Pitzer outgained him 358 to 303, so not an incredible – or that's just through the air, excuse me, 431 to 340, so almost by 100 yards on total offense. Otherwise, I guess some kind of – Metrics that stand out, the two interceptions I talk about, Whitworth did win the time possession battle. They were atrocious on third down, one of nine. Mm, And that's not something that, I mean, we talked about it earlier with Ryan. There were a couple penalties that kind of stalled out some of those drives, some areas that maybe they can shore up as they move on. And that is a long trip over to Illinois, (laughs) Jimmy. But I'm, again, I'm excited. I, I think not that North Central has not been tested. They've beat a couple quality teams this year. I am very curious to see this result. I'm not going to sit here and pick Whitworth as the upset. I think I'd favor North Central going into this one, but like heavily. But I want to see what exactly the cards do with this Whitworth team, this pirate squad that has gutted out some wins against decent opponents this year. Yeah, I think North Central secondary is going to have to bring their A game for sure. I mean, when you have a, a, a dynamic pass game, you're going to have to stop the air. So, I mean, Amen. they come out there and generate some turnovers. I mean, North Central is North Central. I mean, I think this will be – Pretty convincing victory, but I don't think Whitworth is going to duck their tail by any means. They're going to come out. No. And they're ready to go, man. Like it's Whitworth versus everybody. I mean, truly, I don't think anyone put it on a t shirt. No, yeah, for real. I know. I know Wheaton was wearing Wheaton versus everybody hats at the Isthmus Bowl, and that's kind of like their thing. But, you know, the WW, Wheaton, Whitworth, it's like, oh, you know. Fair, fair, <laughs> fair. Yeah. No, I'm excited, dude. And I mean, we'll have the, you know, we didn't talk much about North Central throughout the course of this season, maybe once or twice here and there. We're going to have a reason to talk about them this coming week. So I'm excited yeah. to, to talk about the cards and, and see what they've been doing up, the, up to over there, down there in Illinois. Yeah, me too. Awesome. Week. Week. Hell yeah. Well, thank you, Jim. I appreciate you once again, dude. It's been good. I'm excited for this next round. This is going to be another ridiculous weekend of football. I can sense it. Yeah, man. I'm actually, I can actually watch it this week, too. It's yes. Yeah, we got to be, be tapped in. Yeah, yes. absolutely, dude. Oh, you know it. You know it. Sweet. All right.